Hello and welcome back to April Space 6.4, Harp of Elia. We are back. Yes, welcome. This is another 10 pager, uh, and I'm going to try and tear through this one. I really have to use the bathroom. Rocky's so excited for April Space. Oh. Excuse okay. me, <laughs> Rocky! Stop it! <laughs> Rocky, please. There's no one oh, there, Rocky. What what? I thought you. There? I thought you took care of him. Yeah, he was hungry, but now he's looking out the window and barking at passersby. Uh, well, that that was the greed of a beast, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it. Uh, Aetheros. Was... <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not gonna give a recap. Let's just get right into it. Okay. Atoy Muzazi watched as the doctor pulled a sheet up to cover what was left of Marie Hazard's body. Her empty eyes stared accusingly at him in the moment before they vanished from sight. It was no surprise. He'd expected from the beginning that there'd be no saving Marie. No matter how much you treated the wound with panacea, you couldn't pull someone back from death. Still, perhaps just a little part of him had been hoping to be wrong. That some miracle had indeed been possible. But, even if a miracle had been possible, the time for it had long since expired. Heap hadn't had the facilities necessary to treat such an injury, so Muzazi had, had no choice but to put her in stasis for the two-hour trip back to Landfall, while the medical office there prepared for treatment. Wait, treatment? Hold on, I'm confused. Hmm? I'm so confused what's going on. I, I thought he just said she couldn't be saved, and then he was like, I'm taking her back for treatment. This is what happened in, in the past. Past tense. Uh... Okay. Well, the medical office there prepared for treatment. Every second of that trip had felt like two hours itself. And still it had been fruitless. In the end, all of it had been fruitless. The doctor, an umbrant woman with yellow pupils, looked up at him sympathetically. With an injury like this, she calmly explained, death would have been instant. There was nothing you could have done. I see, Luzazi replied quietly. But that wasn't quite true, was it? There was a great deal he could have done. He could have been faster. He could have been stronger. He could have been better. He could have been... What's the last one? Harder. Harder, better, faster, stronger. He could have been superior to the pathetic man who had, had who had to have been saved. There was so, so much more he could have done, and he'd failed to do so. I see, he said again, his voice nearly silent. Winston's voice, live from his hospital bed, blared out from the script on the table, the cheer in his voice utterly unsuited for the situation. Good news, a toy, his tinny voice said. I've managed to track down the bomb. Apparently, he'd been working through the night to check the ships coming in and out of Nocturnus. Governor Reg Regan, lingering by the door, spoke up. Tracked it down? What good will that do? Wait, what was Regan's voice? It was sort of like this. He was that like... was not it. Tracked it down? What good will that do? He clearly meant it in emotional context, but Winston seemed to take it as a logical query. It's actually not very easy to obtain things like bombs and weapons so far out, he explained. Unless you steal it from local security or have someone smuggle it in for you. And there's no need for security forces on this planet to use a bomb like that. Hence, it was smuggled in. Hence, I found the ship that smuggled it in. Hence, your mom. Atoy Muzazi's grip tightened on the hilt of his sword. He'd become used to being alone. He didn't have any memories of a time when he hadn't been. It wasn't something he especially liked or disliked. It was just his default state of being. Still, being with a partner for a time, he'd quite enjoyed it. Muzazi, no! She's coming he back! Feels. Probably! <laughs> Unless this is her way of like not having to work for the supremacy anymore. She's coming back, Muzazi. It's okay. Well, what would he do if he's like going to take down the smuggler and he gets shot in the back by Marie? She's like, I'm oh, sorry, Muzazi. I, <laughs> I was with all, the Katashi beast. the whole time. <laughs> No. Winston's voice trickled from the script. I have the name of the ship. How about it, a toy? The doctor looked up from her paperwork, then took a step backwards as she saw the dark, murderous expression on his face. Only a few seconds had ha passed, but it truly looked as if a toy Muzazi hadn't slept for a thousand years. While white aether snapped around him like breaking bones. I see, he growled. What is Muzazi's aether core? Um, what would be something like duty or responsibility? Ooh, duty. George, I assume that's George. You know, it's like spelled without the E at the end, right? Okay, never mind. Georg Amazon took a drag of his cigarette, savoring the tinge of bubble that went along with it. It wasn't always easy to get a hold of, but the high it provided took the edge off like nothing else. Someone who's never had a cigarette? It's a bubble. Uh, it's a bubble, you the... fucking idiots. It's a fictional drug. Uh, what's, 
What's bubble? It's a fictional drug. It exists only in a full space see. world. <laughs> uh, pours pours soap in the bathtub. Ah, uh, hi, <laughs> like no other. <laughs> he watched through the lens of his gas mask as the pale blue smoke drifted up to the ceiling of the rusty hangar. This place really was a dump. They'd been paid well for the job, but he had no more desire to stick around Nocturnus. With the amount they'd made, they should be set to take it easy for a couple months, maybe setting up some jobs further into the supremacy. With a flick, the cigarette went flying up into the air, and a second later burst into flames entirely, burning away to nothing. This, this Aether stuff really wasn't half bad either. It'd definitely been worth paying for the tutelage for him and his crew. Progress! Or, no, hang on, what, what's a good voice for him? Progress! He barked to Fridman, his second in command. The stout, goggle-wearing man looked up from the script he was clutching between his hands. We're fully loaded, sir. Ready to head out whenever you give the word. Georg grinned to himself, licking his lips from beneath his mask. It really did feel nice to be in charge. An eight-man crew was hardly a criminal organization, but even holding power over seven other people gave him an indescribable rush. Tell the others to get on board, he declared. We're blowing this shithole. With that, he turned to the hefty cigar-shaped ship behind him, <laughs> the needle point, only to pause when he saw that Fridman wasn't following. The little man had instead stopped, staring straight ahead. Oh, how much do you want to bet the slice is going to come and his top half's going to slide off? <laughs> Boss, he asked nervously. Georg turned to follow his gaze, and his heart almost leapt out of his chest when he saw who was approaching. For years before this gig as a smuggler, Georg had worked for a crime lord known as the Hyena. The guy had been a real piece of work, never shutting up about himself, but a big shot all the same, pretty much ruling over, over Kalis Breck. Georg had incinerated many of his enemies, and had been well compensated in return. All that had ended when the hyena had been killed by a special officer. Georg hadn't been there when it happened. How long has that been, by the way, it's like in the timeline? Now, yeah. Like closer to a year or under half a year? Around half a year. Okay. Georg hadn't been there when it happened, but he'd seen the face of the man who'd done it on the news, and that man was walking towards him now. The name came to his lips. A toy! He hissed, eyes wide behind his mask. Muzazi! <laughs> Muzazi wasn't in full form. One of his arms was still injured, wrapped in bandages, and he was sure his hearing still wasn't perfect after being so close to that explosion. Still, he could hear the furious beating of his heart pulsing through his body like a war drum, and so he couldn't be more prepared. The man in front of him, the captain of this crew, was clad in leather from head to toe. Oh, hell yeah. With a gas mask hiding all of his face save the red hair that flowed from the back of his head. From the way he was stepping back, he clearly recognized that Muzazi was here as no friend. Georg Amuzin? Muzazi asked, voice low. Winston had given him the name. A known weapon smuggler who'd arrived on Nocturnus shortly before the bombing. Apparently, he'd served the hyena on Kalis Breck before taking on this line of work. Muzazi vaguely wondered if they'd met at that time. He didn't remember him, but he'd never had the greatest memory anyway. Me? Just like me, for real? <laughs> Still, even if he didn't recall the man, he knew who he was. The one responsible. Muzazi's hand didn't yet leave Luminescence's sheath. There were three people in his immediate vicinity. Amazon, the stocky man next to him, and an unseen third person standing a distance behind him. There was a moment of silence, and then... Uh, this is Amazon. Okay. Inferno Trafalgar! Amazon roared, thrusting his palms towards Muzazi. In an instant, a torrent of crimson flame burst forth from his hands, utterly consuming the part of the room Muzazi was standing in. Muzazi jumped upwards, thrusters boosting him, barely avoiding being scorched by the wave of fire. As he reached the crest of his jump, Muzazi forced Luminescence into the ceiling, holding himself in place for a moment. George Amuzin. His abilities seemed to involve producing flames and directing them. The exact mechanisms behind it were irrelevant. The movie just used had covered a large area, but there was the possibility Amazon could use it in other ways, too. Muzazi would have to be careful. What? Marie responded. Act like myself. You know you love it. A vein bulged on Muzazi's forehead. No. The time for caution had long since passed. Now his fury held, alone held dominion. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. We're getting real chewy hours. <laughs> the second the flames began to fade... <laughs> Sorry, I saw the move ahead of time. Musashi tore Luminescence free, his fall taking on an unnatural angle as his thrusters pulled him to and throw. Amuzin clapped his hands together, pointing the nozzle forced between his palms, tracking Muzazi as he descended. Piccadilly Rapid! 
Amuzin screamed, and just as the name implied, rapid-fire bullets of heat were launched at Muzazi like deadly glowing embers, easily visible, easily deflected. Muzazi's thrusters flipped him upside down, offering him an easier angle, and he unleashed a series of aether-infused slashes, each snuffing out one of the fire bullets zooming towards him. Those that hadn't been perfectly aimed struck the wall behind instead, melting noticeable holes into the solid material. Muzazi landed on one hand, using that to flip back into a standing position. He wouldn't get any time to rest. The moment Muzazi's feet touched the ground, the stout subordinate next to Amuzin began to gurgle and retch, his throat bulging like that of a toad. Scurrant, most likely, with an aether ability enhancing his physical abnormalities. The stout man's jaw snapped open, and, like a whip, a long and prehensile tongue lashed out, aimed directly for Muzazi's face. Frogman? The moment he went to dodge, however, the end of that tongue sparked with a rancid pink aether and split into three branches, each aimed for a different part of Muzazi's body. Marie tossed the red park at him before he could protest. It's good to get out of your comfort zone, she said. There was a flash of silver, and then the three branches of the tongue burst into blood, each cleanly severed at the root by lightning-fast bites of luminescence. The man staggered backwards, what remained of his tongue thrashing in the air, but Muzazi wasn't finished punishing him. The person behind him jumped into the fray, a burly pugnant wielding an equally large axe. He swung the weapon at Muzazi with all his strength, but the slightest dodge meant that the blade lodged into the floor instead, giving Muzazi the moment of freedom he needed. He seized the bleeding stump of the toad man, squeezing and swinging with all his, the might his injured arm could muster, and smashed the scurrant against the far wall. There was a sickening crunch as the man hit the wall face first, and then slowly trickled down, leaving a substantial trail of blood. That was one. Muzazi ducked down, narrowly avoiding the second axe swing from the pugnant behind him. At the same time as he span around, he withdrew one of his knives from within his parka and sliced at the pugnant's heels, bringing the man down to one knee with a roar of pain. Face to face with those golden eyes, Muzazi raised luminescence to deal the finishing blow. Trafalgar! Change of plans! Inferno! As Amuzin unleashed another wide-range fire attack cooking the hangar, Muzazi seized the pugnant man by the collar and swung him around in the direction of the flames, using him as a human shield. The man thrashed as the aether-infused flames roasted his body, but only for a moment. He passed as the fire did, his charred body falling to the ground as the flames died away. That was two. Muzazi kicked off the ground. Oh, wait, and then... Did three or four of them die earlier when they, like, killed Rolo and all of them? Those were a separate group. Okay, so there's still, like, four guys left in this group. Uh, Muzazi kicked off the ground towards Amuzin, his eyes flicking over as the entrance ramp of the ship flipped down, and three new crewmates came running into view. Okay, literally, never mind. <laughs> a tattooed man wielding a machete, and two young Ubrant men holding butterfly knives. Could he finish Amazon before these enemies entered the fray? Unlikely. Diesel brown aether surrounded Tattoo as he leapt up into the air and landed on a motorcycle that had suddenly appeared, obviously recorded. With a blast of aether infused thrust, the vehicle zoomed towards Muzazi, and as it did, more and more recorded parts appeared on its chassis, each clearly intended to increase lethality. Tank treads, spikes, hooks, shredders, by the time it reached him, it was more a mass of murderous metal than anything intended for transport. The smart thing to do would be to back down and approach from another angle. Marie smiled sweetly at him. Took you long enough, a toy. A toy Muzazi stood his ground, all twelve of his throwing knives blasting out of his parka. By firing thrusters of equal strength from both the tip of the blade and the end of the hilt, Muzazi could effectively freeze his knives in the air, and he did so, forming a barrier of blades between himself and the approaching biker. But he wasn't here to block hits. He was here to eliminate the enemy. On each of the knives, a third thruster burst forth from the side of the blade, and all of them began rapidly spinning in place. Just as Tattoo had manif manifested shredders on his bike, Muzazi had created a shredder in midair. It was right in the path of his attacker. Tattoo swerved to try and avoid the barrier, but it was far too late. His body passed right through the web of blades, and blood poured forth liberally. <laughs> Liberals! Coating Muzazi's body. As body parts rained down and the bike dissipated into aether, Muzazi found himself grinning mirthlessly. That made three. Oh god, is he in his Joker arc? <laughs> Can he be saved, Tan? Muzazi's chance. <laughs> Muzazi chance? The two young Umbrans attacked at once, using the blade barrier as a smokescreen and striking from either side of it. As the two lunged at him, the blades of their butterfly knives stretched out, aiming directly for Muzazi's torso. He could have laughed. He truly, truly could have laughed, if it wasn't so insulting. They really thought they could best him in a contest of blades? Two, surg <laughs> two surgical strikes of luminescence were sufficient to neutralize the threat. The umbrans dropped to the ground in two pieces each. That was not sufficient to, 
to, I assume, sedate Muzazi's yeah. fury. He seized the bottom half of one of the bodies and hurled it towards Amazon. Unfortunately, an application of Trafalgar Inferno reduced it to ash before it could strike him. Still, that was four, and that was five. Anger still burning through Muzazi's body like a fever. He seized the stretched knives out of the air before they could hit the ground and hurled them. One, two, in the direction of the ship. The first hit another crewmate, an older man in the monk's habit, who was rapidly descending the ramp. It struck him in the head with such force that it went flying off, and kept going until it had pinned his ruined cranium to the wall of the hangar. Jesus, Tan. Six. All that guy did was, he didn't even get to fucking use an ability. (laughs) (laughs) The second knife hit the main thruster of the ship, lodging deep in its inner workings. There was a crackle of aether from it, and then a thruster appeared on the base of the handle. Excuse me driving it deeper, deeper into the ship's engine until it burst into flame, showering the hangar in chunks of burning metal. Muzazi saw no body, but he was willing to bet by the number of body parts that were raining down that that was seven, which left only one. Georg Amazon was utterly untouched by the fiery explosion, which only made sense. That leather outfit he was wearing must have been fireproof to defend against his own flames, and was probably infused with aether to enhance those qualities even further. The red-haired man took a step back as Muzazi took a step forward, Twin red flames still... Sp- I would do something like took a step back as Muzazi advanced. Just to vary up the vocab a little. Yeah, sure. Uh, twin red flames still sprung from the man's palms, bearing something of a resemblance to Muzazi's thrusters. You fucked up asshole! Amazon hissed, a hysterical giggle infiltrating his tone. That's the two-minute mark! Londinium! Oh, you can you can resist putting some British in there. All his names... The moment that last word... All his word. moves and names after London landmarks. <laughs> Wait, are they actually... Yeah. What's Trafalgar? Trafalgar Square. That's so funny. (laughs) I actually love that. The moment that last word passed his lips, the flames bursting from his hands intensified. Now I'm wondering how many other people had, like, naming schemes to their moves. The flames bursting from his hands intensified, their heat growing until the flames turned blue, stretching almost up to the ceiling in their renewed vigor. Fiery orange aether raged around Amazon as he laughed, almost intoxicated by this clear boost in power. He stepped forward again, regaining the ground he'd lost. There were about ten meters between him and Natoi Muzazi. Two minute mark? From hearing that, Muzazi could clearly guess what this Londinium ability entailed. Once Georg Amazon had been in battle for a set period of time, he could intensify the heat and ferocity of his flames tenfold. Well, how did you know exactly tenfold? Well, he's just sort of there was no way. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way of telling if this was the limit of his strength then, or if he'd just get another power boost in two minutes' time. Even without knowing that, though, Muzazi could tell a torrent of these flames wouldn't be something he could survive. She would retreat then, and observe from a distance. Nice to meet you, Toy, Marie said, extending a lazy hand. Let's work well together. Musta- Muzazi stood his ground, his blade raised high. This was a contest of strength, to determine which of them was supreme. There would be no retreat for him or his opponent. Atoy Muzazi discarded everything. His burning temper, the aching pains of his body, even the anguish that had brought him here in the first place. His eyes stared ahead blank, blanky like glass, <laughs> and a line of jewel ran from his mouth. But that was no matter. Right here, right now, he was nothing more than a hand to hold a blade. Gatsu? He adjusted his stance, pulling his sword back and pointing it at Amazon as the flames raged around his opponent's hands. Win or lose, this would be the end of the confrontation. There would be one more corpse on the ground before the minute had passed. Amuzin took a deep breath. Trafalgar and fur! Muzazi stabbed him through the chest, his sword stained red with blood. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Emerging from Amuzin's back on the way out. The voice of Georg Amuzin died on his tongue as the air was pushed out of his lungs. He attained his ma- um, attained his mouth to say something? Yeah, he opened his mouth things. to say something. S- some final words, but Muzazi roughly pulled his sword free and the smuggler fell wordless to the ground. This was a toy Muzazi's masterpiece. In less than a syllable's time, he'd cross ten meters and dispatch the enemy. His enemy. His speed when fighting ordinarily was impressive, but this was divine. The principle behind the increased speed was simple. He'd coated his entire musculature with invisible thrusters, programmed to activate only in sympathy to his own movements. The speed of every movement he made was multiplied countless times as a result. Full throttle. That was what he'd call this technique. It only seemed appropriate. Finally, long overdue, the fire alarms activated in response to the flames, and water rained down in a deluge. It ran down Muzazi's face and body, washing away the freshest of the blood, but the stains from the start of the battle stubbornly remained, and nothing could wash away what had come beforehand. Muzazi fell to one knee, his entire body aching. This was the first time he'd used full throttle, but he could already tell that forcibly moving his muscles like this would cause significant damage. 
Slowly, with shaky hands, he sheathed luminescence. He desperately hoped for the euphoria of victory once he'd defeated these people, or even just a simple relief, but... But he didn't feel any better at all. Uh, it's time to popcorn. Regan's sigh came loud and clear of the script on Muzazi's table. I understand that battle is, um, unpredictable, he said, but it would have been very helpful if you'd left one alive to extract information from at least. His hands on the table, Muzazi stirred down at the script, his eyes dull. Even this obvious reprimand, his heart didn't quicken in the slightest. All of this right now was just noise. So Holy shit, Muzazi ignoring fucking authority? Oh my god, he really is going through like his Black Swordsman arc. It's as you say, he muttered. Battle is unpredictable. With that, he tapped the screen of the script and the call ended. The last thread they could pull had thoroughly turned into a dead end thanks to his foolish actions. The ventral fever that had filled him for those few minutes had thoroughly died down. Now he felt like nothing more than a stringless puppet. Even the effort to breathe seemed toilsome. Even as for Aelia, Muzazi couldn't help but feel that things had come to a conclusion. Katashi Olafantadaka had fallen comatose after his injuries and showed no signs of waking up. The smugglers who being in contact with the complex had been slaughtered to a man, and Murray, whose hazard, his more competent half, had left this world. There were no more avenues to walk down. All was lost. The venomous words of Dragon Hadrian, spoken in that interrogation room back on Talden, came to mind. No, Muzazi! These things you ramble on about, honour, dignity, all that shit, they don't exist. They're things people made up to make themselves seem more noble. There's no difference between me shooting you in the back and shooting you in the front. If I were to pull out a gun right now and shoot you, while your hands were tied, it wouldn't mean a thing. You'd be dead and I'd be alive, so I'd be the winner. The person who's willing to do what it takes, whatever it takes, gets what they want. That's the rule. That's the only rule. Perhaps you'd be right after It's all. so weird because, like... Looking at that, Jurgan, you can tell he really did grow up in the supremacy. <laughs> Muzazi had approached this pitch black world of honour with dignity and had been rewarded with the bomb of an invisible enemy. Could there be anything more dishonourable than that? Even shooting someone in the back was more personal. Even, Damn. Even thinking about it was too much right now. Muzazi turned away from the table. The residence governor of Regan had provided landfall 01 and all the amen amenities Muzazi needed. He threw himself down on the hard couch and blankly watched the video graphs being streamed to the master on the wall. Comedies, game shows, old classics. As the hours stretched on, the clock on the wall incessantly beeping to indicate night hours had begun. The light from the video graphs were reflected off Muzazi's eyes as he watched them uncomprehendingly. Even if he was in no state to enjoy these features, though, it was good to have noise. Noise to fill the silence where his one and only partner now lived. No! <laughs> there was a knock on the door. I know it sounds like I'm being like teasing, cause I'm, but I, I swear I'm just doing this because I'm trying not to actually cry because I feel so bad for him. The protagonist of the videograph <laughs> made a crude joke, and his travelling companions loudly complained. They were a band of warriors travelling to a distant mountain so they could throw the corpse of an ancient evil emperor into the volcano there. If he were in an ordinary state of mind, it was as he imagined he would have quite enjoyed that plot. Would Marie have enjoyed the jokes, he wondered? There was a knock on the door. It was as he glanced up. Someone had come. Was it Reagan with information he couldn't communicate with the script? Perhaps Winston had leaped out of his hospital bed and come to drag him back into the investigation. Or perhaps some unknown enemy was waiting outside, ready to dispatch him before he could find out any more. There was a knock on the door. Whatever the case was, as he decided, he'd respond in kind. His hand on Luminescence's hilt, he made his way to the door. Pausing for a moment, as the metallic knocking sounded out once again. He took a deep breath, readying his aether, and tapped the button to open the door. It slid open the cold air outside already infiltrating the units. Apart from the frigid darkness in the snow, however, there was nothing at the door. Some childish prank, then? His hand on his sword, Muzazi slowly looked to the left, then the right. Still nothing. Down here, a toy, sighed an already exasperated voice. He glanced down. Special Officer Marie Hazard was much smaller than he remembered. Yeah, she said, fists on her hips. I guess I've got some explaining to do. Oh my god. Muzazi, pick her up and give her a hug. She's alive. <laughs> Muzazi depression arc. <laughs> See, this is cool though, because now he's realized that what matters are the people he cares about, not honor and dignity. This, this'll this be good. I cannot wait to see his reaction next chapter. I'm actually so excited. <laughs> uh, I want to see, I want to see how he goes about this. Um, cause we have yet to see Muzazi overcome with positive emotions and I need them. Uh, so... 
Uh, God, I know you don't have the rest ready. I was about to ask if we could read six points. I don't have it ready. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know I kept making jokes during like the serious parts, but just like you did with your turn to die, it was me trying not to cry <laughs> in the middle. Because even though I knew she was alive, I just like, oh, it was hurting so bad. And I already cried a lot last night it's reading like, reaction, the yeah. later chapters of My Hero. I was so sad for him. I just want Muzasi to be happy. Is that so wrong? <laughs> Will Muzasi be happy by the end of April Space? Yes or no? I'm curious, though. The fact that she's still small instead of, like, regenerated makes me think she must have taken... She's in, like, healing mode or something. Tiny Marie. <laughs> I need to know the details. <laughs> I can't believe I'm finally as tall as Marie Hazard. This is awesome. <laughs> Oh, Musashi. And, um, okay, I have a question for you, Tan, yeah. and or the viewers, but I want to hear at least one answer from you. Because uh, we haven't done one of these in a while, but you mentioned some of the stuff Musazi was watching. What would be a game show in Aetheral Space World? Um, it would depend, really. I'm like, what you, I like the idea of one called Who Reigns Supreme, and it's like a competition between like ten people who have to do an obstacle course. Absolutely. The name was a source of controversy from uh, conservative parties in the body, however, because it was disrespecting the office of the Supreme. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, and they had the host dress up as like a mockery of the Supreme. And uh, what I did, uh, something else to note is um, the, the guy that Muzasi sort of owned here, Jorg Amazon, he does actually appear in Arc 1, but he doesn't do anything. <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah, he's mentioned a couple of times. Huh. When? Um, he's just like like one of the uh, Heiner's goons. He's like, he has a flamethrower at that time. Oh, but I thought he mentioned that uh, he wasn't around when Muzasi killed Hyena. He wasn't like in the room is what he meant. <laughs> right, right, right. Damn. Huh, who knew? Deep so you can learn Aether Space within Fox. six months' time. Yeah, what a Because they, he mentioned paying for tutelage. How could he have learned it so quickly? Perhaps we'll learn more at a later date. Perhaps there's some sort of Aether-boosting drug. <laughs> These are questions that should be asked. I'm very, very excited to see how this goes next chapter. Uh, do you have any idea when it might be done? Um, probably fairly soon. I'm like, I, Before I took a break for this week, I was six pages into it. Okay, well, as soon as it's done, let me know, because I want to read it. Okay. This longing in my, in my the chest. The greed of a beast. The greed of a beast. The greed of a reader. <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a fucked up moment. I, I rented this trilogy of books that someone on SCPD recommended, and I saw I got notifications from the library, so I was like, okay, so I go, and only the second and third book in the trilogy were there, and it's been like a week, and I st the first one still doesn't come in, and I'm really pissed off. Oh, dear. I can't read it. I'm trying to read the Scythe trilogy, and I just can't. I'm sorry. Alright. Yeah, it's okay. You would never do that with Aetheral Space, right? Of course. You would always make sure there's enough books at the library. Of course. Always at Trafalgar. Trafalgar so, I'm right curious, there. are there any other people who have had, like, uh, themes with their Aether moves? Because I kind of, now that you mention it with Georg, I mean, it's probably too late with all the characters that have been introduced, but just like, you know, JoJo stands have bands, it might be cool if, like, the all the Aether moves are based on, like, old places from Earth instead yeah, of, because they're, like... If there the are themes, it would be different themes for different people, because it's, um... Yeah, it wouldn't always be places, it could be other stuff. Well, have there been any other themes? Because so far, what we've seen mostly of themes is, like, they ha there's like a central thing like Gemini with Dragon or Heartbeat with Skipper and then they like add on techniques to that. So this was the first time we saw like different names related to a thing. It was kind of neat. Yeah. So yeah, it's because So there haven't been any other. So Geo, for example, those are like m more different techniques so they have different names because what he's done is just like made huge fire and then recorded it and then just let bits of it out mm -hmm. with different techniques. I assume he was just like Altering the oxygen in the air or something to make fire. Yeah, the, the fire's all prepped for, so we can run out. <laughs> oh, interesting. But that's no longer a concern, because he's dead. Alright, well, I, I should probably end this episode, because I really still got a shit. It's been like a half hour. Okay. Um, Londinium. But I will see you guys next time. <laughs> Bye. Londinium. Bye! <laughs>